हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर सदानंद साहू फ्रॉम इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट ए मॉडल डायस्परा डेवलपमेंट एंड फिलंथ्रोपी अंडर पेपर सोशियोलॉजी ऑफ इंडियन डायस्परा सो स्टूडेंट्स लेट्स सी व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न फ्रॉम दिस मॉडल दिस मॉडल प्रोवाइड्स रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन डायस्परा एंड डेवलपमेंट हाउ डायस्परा फिलंथ्रोपी रिलेट्स टू डेवलपमेंट how diaspora philanthropy evolves in a globalized world in general and india in particular structure of this presentation will be first i'll give introduction then i'll explain what is diaspora philanthropy and its relationship to development uh, diaspora philanthropy in the context of global equity concept of remittances uh, foreign direct investment institutional approach diversities in the diaspora philanthropy development has been a fundamental aspiration of humanities since time immemorial uh, development is a contested terrain for some time uh, it was mostly associated with economic growth but later on there has been lots of debate in recent time development is more uh, inclusive it is seen as overall human progress with capability expansion emancipation empowerment sustainability equity democracy we might be familiar with the, the concept like human development index human poverty index and gender related uh, development indexes so these are uh, in recent time uh, dominates the development concept diaspora and development in a globalized environment globalization and the role of diaspora in development process cannot be understood without the role of institutions and networks it created we found that after 90s there are several institutions like ministries ngo alumni association political groups which have played a major role in diaspora linkages both in home country and post country with the development of technology they have also created online groups and many other platform where they share their ideas knowledge both uh, home country and host countries in 90s we find many home countries also created their own diasporic institutions and networks where they uh, promote them to transfer technology education health skill development and social causes in fact diaspora also in recent time also played a big role in india especially in political affairs you find many of these political parties they have overseas groups bjp aam aadmi party congress they have overseas groups and they played a big role in recent elections development the basic objective of development is to create an enabling environment for people to live long healthy and creative life how do we relate it to the diaspora development experience vary with context countries stages of development etc however most important aspect that is dominating today is that of human being human being possess skills ideas knowledge this forms the basis of economic progress good governance innovation investment cultural development etc when you talk about human being their process of everything so whenever people migrate they also take this thing with them so there are you know sometimes when there is a particular institution back home they can sometimes harness these skills because diaspora people they always relate with the homeland whenever people migrate they change the situation there by offering their ideas skills and knowledge today's progress of us europe is possible broadly because of migrant people diaspora when people migrate they don't forget their land of origins they connect it with emotionally culturally and socially usually diaspora we don't apply in the regional context somebody from within india kerala migrating to delhi tamilians migrating to other parts of india we don't call them diaspora but when it happens 
in the international context we call it diaspora diaspora as you have already studied in earlier chapter also it is mainly in international context we call indian diaspora chinese diaspora italian diaspora like this so there are about 25 to 30 million indian diaspora today they are spread across 150 or more countries diaspora and development diaspora's contribution to development is already acknowledged and it is very well researched area today scholars such as devas kapoor dilip rath author desi finds various developmental engagement of diaspora in home country as well as host countries there are number of other studies also when you talk about the remittances investment so diaspora role is prominent in especially countries like china and india they have been playing a bigger role diaspora and development foreign direct investment for example in china more than 90% of the foreign direct investment comes from chinese diaspora in india also the proportion is rising over time especially after 90s sector such as information technology healthcare education sees a growing interest among diasporic investment in remittances india receives largest amount of remittances in the world which is about 70 billion in 2014 that accounts for 4% of total country gdp remittances are used for various purpose including foreign direct investment education healthcare livelihood purpose many other advocacy advocacy is another area where diaspora plays a very constructive role sometimes or sometimes also negative role but that is also a very major area of engagement in recent years for example advocacy can be in terms of development advocacy in terms of education literacy in terms of democracy so it can be done through online and offline like through blogs through facebook or through campaign online campaign it can happen also direct in, through direct involvement coming back to country and uh, involving so advocacy you can find in terms of election campaigning and in terms of uh, raising awareness in terms of mobilizing fund for some good cause so there are many other ways where advocacy we can find let me talk about de- development and philanthropy how they are related philanthropy is a positive human trait reflected through wide range of social behaviors uh, philanthropy exists in every civilization it can work as a complementary to the other methods of development uh, it may not be the mainstream uh, development education healthcare advocacy for democracy are partly result of philanthropy we are familiar about alumni association donating for education in various institutions such as iit what is diaspora philanthropy let me explain werner who explained diaspora are the embodiment of cultural political and philanthropic and sentimental preferences so when you talk about diaspora it is directly relating to uh you know cultural political and philanthropy so uh, there is a relation between diaspora and philanthropy emerging diaspora institutions and networks across the globe uh, here i am giving a overview how diasporic institutions are coming not just in india but uh, elsewhere because this is the context you know last 20 30 years you find many diasporic institutions and networks are emerging which facilitates both homeland and hostland interaction for sending country institutional innovation for example in india we have ministry of overseas indian affairs of course now it is merged with the ministry of external affairs but in the past few years it played a very major role in engaging with indian diaspora and it usually uh, conduct uh, several you know events like pravasi bharatiya divas there are uh, many pravasi bharatiya divas across uh, different countries and within india also mainly to engage the diaspora 
in a sustainable way. There, in other countries also, they have similar setup, like Armenian Ministry of Diaspora. There are advocacy and welfare relief for diasporic population. For example, the Department of National Minorities and Lithuanian Living Abroad. So there are Irish abroad unit. There are also professional business network. For example, Global Scott in Scotland. The people from Scotland who migrated to other country, they have professional network called Global Scott. They share the information which are professionally important back home. And they also engage with the country's innovation and uh, academic and uh, other life. There are also in India, we find Indus entrepreneurs. There are key New Zealand, Advanced Australia. There are association in Silicon Valley, which actually mentor the innovators who are from the same community. So that's why particularly these as associations and institutions are very important for development. When we talk about diaspora and development, these are very important. I already gave an overview about to other countries, but in India specifically, diaspora engagement is diaspora engagement with home country is a very recent phenomenon. If you think in a broad range of area, earlier it was there, but mainly in nationalism and freedom movement, but over time their impact, their engagement is growing. So in 1980s, 1990s and 2000, there are uh, phenomenal growth, if you see, 1980s it was mainly the first phase, you can say, the fresh migrants, fresh diaspora who engaged. 1990s it was mainly economic engagement and after 2000 it was more wider range of engagement with diaspora. So after the development of this cyber uh, space, internet and uh, networks, so there was many more diasporic engagement with the back home. For example, social networking sites, websites, new groups that instantly connect with a large group of diasporic communities with India. There are also philanthropic networks in India and abroad because of this cyber network that get facilitated. What constitute diaspora institutions and networks? There are mainly three areas which I find important for classifying diaspora institutions and networks. One is political and social. You find every political party in India, they have overseas networks and vice versa. You find the affiliation of many of our Indian political association with other countries also similarly. There are social level networks like caste association, regional association, community association. There are also faith-based associations. For example, Hindu abroad, they have their own network, six in several countries. And Muslims also have their own association, Christians and so on and so forth. So there are several associations of diasporic group based on faith. And they play a major role also in philanthropy and development back home. One way, the, this faith-based organization, they are very well connected across the globe. They have a very deep regional as well as faith-based network. For example, if you talk about uh, Andhra associations abroad, they are also linked with faith, certain faith like uh, Tirupati and uh, Sai Baba and all this. Sometimes it goes beyond the regional networks. The third one is professional and alumni network. Professional networks are directly, you can talk, they are more into developmental participation. For example, doctors in USA, they have their own network called API. Alum networks, IITs, IIM, and many other universities and institutions in India, they have alumni networks abroad also. So they play a role, big role in institution building, education, and philanthropy back home. So 
there are in addition to that there are virtual space and diasporic network for example diaspora network also they have presence in facebook linkedin web portal and these are platform to not only mobilize the resources but also consultation and um, idea sharing so this sometimes complementary to the other networks once again diaspora philanthropy philanthropy in the academic and policy discourse is a in fact philanthropy is widely debated in recent times in both in policy and academics some university like harvard they have special research uh, department called global equity so there they argue that diaspora philanthropy can play a big role in terms of uh, uh, supporting the underdeveloped and developing countries to come up in development process so diaspora philanthropy can play a complementary role in the development process they are saying so diaspora philanthropy is not value free rather it has a history we find diaspora philanthropy has a civilizational history in many countries we find asian diaspora philanthropy history of uh, every religion has a philanthropic side and there are countries which have largely dependent upon philanthropic support like afghanistan so the overall philanthropy plays a very big role in many places the today if we see the size of global philanthropy it is about 56 billion dollar in 2010 and which actually growing in globally remittance and philanthropy upon comes together because when you talk about philanthropy it is not just one kindness of some one time giving it is a continuous engagement sometimes it comes through remittance it comes through aid it comes through various knowledge dissemination it comes like mentoring it's a very wide range of area and it in the recent time we find that there are also many challenges which actually face in the process of harnessing the potential of philanthropy networking and institutional support are very essential to harness this philanthropy comes through various channels for example individual sometimes individual con- contribution are in fact more visible because in the absence of institution you find many individuals that directly come to their homeland and involved and second is the intermediary sometimes the individual they don't come frequently to the homeland but they channel their philanthropy through ngos or some institutions institutional support a institution at the national level or state level for example a ministry through certain kind of ministry like human resource development or any ministry the philanthropy also sometimes channel and sometimes through undp like organization who are international they can link both the diaspora group and home country and channelize the philanthropic for example 20 years back UNDP brought token program where diasporic professionals uh, engaged with some professional idea sharing or some project back home so it was very successful so diasporic philanthropy can be can be channeled through all these processes how to attract diaspora philanthropy in fact uh, in many countries like china and philippines they have made more easier way to engage their diaspora in many other ways in the sense giving you know visa rule very relaxing visa rules and giving some kinds of encouragement through economic participation giving recognition for their activities and engaging them culturally sometimes these are all to give a package where in economic incentive and cultural and emotional incentives should go together so that the diaspora will feel you know comfortable to come back home and engage in various uh, philanthropic and developmental activities it happens in, in fact some 
initiatives were done by successive government from UPA and India to facilitate more hassle-free engagement of diaspora. For example, the introduction of PIO card. For example, there are so many policies which uh, India bond, resurgent bond, all those things given to NRI so that they can also feel that they are part of the growth of this country. Top. How do we mobilize diaspora philanthropy? Uh, there are sociological factors which are based on identity like region, religion, ethnic, composition, language, caste. There are also professional and alumni association. Uh, these are the uh, identity which actually provides a rallying point for uh, diaspora group to mobilize philanthropy. It also requires uh, institutions and networks to you know, sustain this. Unless you have a network and institution, it's very difficult people with philanthropy institution to channel their resources to the homeland. Issues and challenges. There are several issues concerning to diaspora philanthropy. For example, the heterogeneity of the population of diaspora. As we know, India is so much diverse with so many regions, communities, ethnic groups, caste. The same thing we find in diaspora also. You find regional association like Gujarati diaspora, Punjabi diaspora, Telugu diaspora, and so on and so forth. And also you find more specifically in some places you find caste association like Telugu, there are caste association in North America, Telugus in North America affiliated to certain caste and other Telugus affiliated to another caste. So there are various uh, caste group also. There are also religious based group like Hindu diaspora and Christian diaspora as I already told you before. So all this uh, creates more complexity in fact to relate with the uh, back home. The, you have same challenge how to engage them back home. And certain uh, rich states like Punjab and uh, Kerala and Gujarat, they have a different dynamism to engage diaspora because they have investment and other things which are, I think diaspora is investing more in the, some of these places than backward uh, states like Bihar, Odisha and all, because they have some level of uh, progress also. Then second point is diaspora concentration in urban areas. You find mostly diaspora investment and diaspora activities are concentrated in urban areas like Chandigarh, Ahmedabad, and you can find Hyderabad. So this area, in terms of if we see the health, education, and every kind of involvement. But there are also specific, some places, it's not that, that much um, prominent, but in some places, in, in Punjab, we find rural focus also among diasporic group. There are also professional network, as I mentioned, but the challenges with the professional networks is most of the institutions in India, they are not uh, capable of uh, harnessing the diasporic potential because of uh, lack of infra infrastructure, lack of uh, peer group at home play, home institutions, lack of uh, touch culture or innovation culture. So these all hamper the professional network to really, you know, engage with the back home institutions. The other uh, major uh, issue is, is generational linkage. You see the past generation among all diaspora group will be more active. They are, they have the familiarity with the, you know, people back home and that make them, you know, relate more than the second, third or fourth generation. It happens uh, when you compare with the NRI, they are directly relate to the back home places where their family is there, you find some of family members are still living back home. So you find a continuity which you don't find among second or third generation because they mostly cut off. And you, same thing can apply with old and new diaspora because old diasporas are mainly they relate with the back home country with a, with a imaginary, in an imaginary way, virtual 
cultural, mostly they link, I think, with the Bollywood and literature. Whereas the NRIs are more into in politics, economics, um, like investment and all this. And they, they can sometimes, you know, come back. And they have still a constituency back home. Uh, like I told you, there is a ministry of overseas, which now, of course, is merged, but that major focus was NRI rather than the old diaspora. So these are all the things which you, when you want to engage with diaspora, you have to take care of. The heterogeneity, you know, channelizing the philanthropy to more, you know, diverse way, not for concentrating in the urban area, and the matching with the diasporic professional group expectation. Otherwise, they cannot play a big role. And the generation, when you talk, we have to relate with the generation through continuous engagement, like uh, some good initiative which ministry doing. Uh, for example, along with Prabhasi Bharatiya Divas, they also promote uh, Indian culture among the third and fourth generation diaspora through uh, No India program and through various other programs. So these are all can be more, you know, practice and more, it should be spread to other regional level, uh, state level, so that the diasporic philanthropy can be uh, harnessed better way. So students, let us summarize what we have learned in this model. Though one cannot ignore the potential of diaspora philanthropy, it is not a solution for all situations. Uh, India being a vast country having a complex problems, uh, needs a variety of alternative interventions. Diaspora philanthropy can be promoted through uh, the involvement of civil society along with NGOs. Non-profit organizations need, need to establish a distinct identity, adopt transparent, transparent accountable mechanism and approaches for fundraising in a strategic fashion and extend their program sphere to tackle hitherto uh, are typical areas not previously addressed by the other organizations. There is a need for appropriate policies, infrastructure, legal and regulatory tax system and resources in place to involve the diaspora communities in national developmental initiatives. Often there is a wide gap of perceptions of development by the diasporic person who wishes to develop the local community and the community's own perception of development. There is a gap. Thus, there should be proper understanding and collaboration between them in order to bring in substantial changes. What are the psychological, intellectual, and emotional attributes of the potential collaborator at home institutions? How does the home community perceive the diaspora's involvement? Are the dynamics of cooperation between the diaspora community and those at home well understood? These are important to understand in the process of engaging the diaspora in the development. Proper documentation of diasporic activities are also necessary to measure the volume of activities overseas Indians offer and the expertise and the kind of activities they are interested in. The documentation may help in making proper distribution of their services to the less privileged. Various institutions, most notably scholarly and academics, have to be actively and carefully engaged to implement such initiatives, even if national governments embrace such initiatives without the full support of institutions and their scholars. Chances are that they may be uh, avoided. This is not, of course, a rational to advocate that initiatives between the diaspora and the institutions be channeled through government bureaucracy. While the Indian non-profit sector is a large and lively, India's legal, tax and regulatory system do not encourage the creation of foundations. Laws governing the actors are complex. Laws governing the sectors are complex and archaic and their implementation is cumbersome and bureaucratic. One important law, for example, dates from 1860. Tapping the philanthropic contribution in different generations needs institutional support at various levels. However, 
Due to various limitations at the political and administrative levels, uh, many of these potential donors are not able to connect with the home country. It is very important to consider diaspora as a stakeholder, where they find meaning in ideas, financial and other support. Thank you.